We have now discussed values and social responsibility in general, applied that into cultural and political settings. However, what happens when we begin to discuss the realities of globalization and social responsibility? Our core objective in this lecture is to discuss the influences and challenges placed on social responsibility in a globalized context. So we make all the value debates that we've been discussing in the previous lectures infinitely more complicated by putting this into a globalization framework. As a starting point for the challenge, we can compare three different multinational sets of expectations for socially responsible organizations to get a flavor of the problem that we're talking about. First, we have the MNE Declaration for Multinational Enterprises. The goal is to encourage positive contribution of multinational corporations to make economic and social progress while minimizing and resolving problems created by working across borders. Compare that to the UN Global Compact, a global platform that convenes companies with UN agencies, labor and civil society to support fundamental principles in the areas of human rights and labor. And finally, the OECD guidelines, which are government-backed recommendations on responsible business conduct to ensure sustainable development, which is designed to ensure economic and social well-being of people around the world. Ultimately, take a look at these and we can begin to see a lot of potential frustrations in how CS is defined and understood when we start to compare different groups, how they view it, and in an international context. So when we're talking about globalization and CSR, there are five dimensions of globalization that are particularly relevant when we're discussing social responsibility and how it can evolve in a multinational environment. First, globalization is often characterized by changing political decisions and disruptions. For example, we might have changing core agreements, like when the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade was replaced by the World Trade Organization. We could have the evolution of the G7 to the G20. So in 1999, there was an inaugural meeting of the seven leading economies to try and discuss mutual financial interests. This has evolved into a more inclusive group, but one that incorporates 19 nations and the EU and accounts for about 85% of the gross world's production, 80% of global trade, and two-thirds of the world's population. Its goal is to maintain financial stability or relative stability, but the thing is that the changing of global political decisions can threaten to upset the stability and the balance because of the ever-changing nature of geopolitics. Second, globalization has fundamentally influenced and been influenced by the evolutions in technology. So, for example, drops in the cost of transportation meant that it could be less expensive to take raw materials, ship them to other places in the world for manufacture, and then ship them again to their target markets. But the greatest change in the last 10 years has been in the communications industry, allowing constant connection amongst people across the world. Now, we should not make light of the influence of social media, engagement and global sales on environments because government business and expectations for all kinds of behaviors has been shifted in organizations. With live streaming, we can organize, view, and participate with organizations in ways that have never been possible before. Third, Global socio-cultural developments are also being affected by globalization. Today, people are more mobile, able to relocate, able to work from different locations, and even the means of production in most countries have substantially changed because of globalization. And so we're seeing three strong outcomes of globalization on our cultures. First, whether good, bad, or somewhere in between, we're seeing a reduction of homogeneous cultures and a greater likelihood that cultures are pluralistic, often including people from vastly different cultural traditions. So we're having to find new ways to get along with folks that we share little in common with. Second, this means that not only are people living in different places than they ever have been, been before, but we're also seeing the acceleration of value and lifestyle change. Third, 
We also see a proliferation of social movements supporting a vast and often acrimonious set of concerns and interests within a single country or a single region. So speaking with a single voice is more difficult than it ever had been before. Fourth, economic developments are changing our expectations of our organizations and our environments as well. For example, consumers want to be able to get products from places and other places in the world at a reasonable cost. But it also means that global companies are more powerful because they have the means to manage supply, build demand, and affect many different economies on a global scale. Yet there are also changing market pressures on multinational corporations because of the changes in communication technology, we also see a greater level of transparency and demand for accountability for multinational organizations and their actions globally. Yet at the same time as we're seeing the opportunities multiply, we're also seeing a meaningful emergence of transnational risks for organizations where disasters have far-reaching effects and the emergence of crises that used to be regionally contained are impossible to contain today. However, these dimensions of globalization also bring with it five distinctive potential benefits. We have a greater access to goods and services provided by organizations from other places. For example, I can go to Aldi and get a Frikadellen, something I loved eating when I was in Germany. Likewise, I can find root beer, something that's uncommon outside the U.S., but I grew up and love. But beyond consumer goods, we're also seeing evidence of emerging global norms and expectations. With the Rana Plaza collapse in Bangladesh, we saw global clothing manufacturers having to answer questions about their supply chains that were never asked before. Some companies then decided to stop doing business altogether in Bangladesh because they couldn't guarantee where their supply was coming from. But then problems for factory safety turn into problems for employment while the supply chain picks up somewhere else. So expectations have both intended and unintended consequences. This also demonstrates a core challenge for workforces in Western countries. Outsourcing is a way to save money. So in the US and UK, for example, we find very little manufacturing left and people who were traditionally employed in these relatively well-paid industries throughout the 20th century have been economically displaced within their own nations. Yet countries like Germany have maintained a strong manufacturing sector, sector which arguably promotes a more stable, well rounded economy that distributes wealth more fairly than a service economy like ours do. Finally, we're all able to make these connections. We're finding that we genuinely have a more global output. Think about the people that you know and work with. In most industries, we're finding that we're regularly interacting with people from very different places and traditions. We're getting to know others in a more meaningful way than has ever been possible at any point in our history. Yet at the same time as there are possibilities, globalization has its problems as well. Like my example with the loss of manufacturing in the U.S. and U.K. demonstrates, within many nations we're seeing an increasing gap between the richest and the poorest people. Yet that's also true between wealthier and emerging economies as well. This suggests that the opportunities for emerging co economies to compete in a global environment can be problematic at best. We're also seeing an emergence of neocolonialism across many emerging economies. Now, during the colonial era, era, European countries would invade and claim ownership of other places and resources. Today, however, neocolonialism tends to work a bit differently. Instead of traditional military occupation, which certainly does still exist to some extent, what we see is the economic intrusion of multinational companies that affect local economies and local economic opportunities. For example, in the Ivory Coast, in the post-colonial era, the country emerged as an agricultural power, but only in a few products, in particular cocoa, coffee, and early on peanuts. Multinational corporations encourage traditional agricultural economies to focus on their production on these crops, oftentimes abandoning subsistence farming. So when the prices of these products was high, the country did incredibly well. 
However, in the 70s and 80s, when the floor fell out of these products, so did the national economy, leading to an economic and then political crisis that plagued the country well into the 90s. So the new face of colonialism tends to be the multinational corporation. This also leads to problems of sustainable practices in these countries where resources are used until they're no longer viable and the multinationals leave and leave with them the money and the opportunities that they brought. So these problems are more than just academic or intellectual problems. They also manifest themselves into meaningful global problems. We are using finite resources more quickly. As an example, when China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, in 2002, its coal use began to rapidly increase. But we're also seeing global emissions of CO2 grow. So where the more advanced economies like those in Europe and China are now beginning to make meaningful changes to curb CO2 emissions, emerging economies see the new global expectations as unfair and are likely to curb their economic development with some nations arguing that it's all well and good that countries that are already economically successful change their behaviors but they aren't able to compete unless they also develop in the same ways using dirty technologies. All of this means that it is generally impossible to predict how national policy will affect the global economy on a regular basis. We know that, for example, with the Brexit vote, the pound dropped substantially and hasn't yet recovered because of all of the uncertainty still remaining about the UK's exit from the EU. But that the kinds of impacts that will come, their form and their shape, nearly impossible to determine, despite what many economists like us believe, it's because it's still shaped by confidence in the global markets, and that can vary with a lot of different factors. Now, in other ways, globalization levels the playing field in ways that makes it actually harder for developed countries to compete. So countries with lower cost structures, for example, they have lower wages, less benefits to workers, uh, more inexpensive coal in its energy mix, and more lenient rules on pollutions are able to outcompete in terms of price structures typical OECD countries. For example, in the United States, the percentage of U.S. citizens with jobs started dropping about the time that China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. Now that China has changed it, a lot of its uh, environmental laws and rules and regulations, it may also find it difficult to compete with other emerging economies. So finally, globalization tends to encourage dependence across nations, which often limits self-sufficiency. So the problem of manufacturing in the U.S. and U.K. that I discussed is an example of a problem of globalization. So what does all this have to do with social responsibility? Fundamentally, it complicates a question of to whom is an organization responsible. So as we explore the topic of social responsibility in upcoming lectures, we'll also develop our understanding of the different domains of social responsibility. But for now, if we think about social responsibility as a values-based set of strategic decisions that reflects how an organization sees itself with respect to its community, Globalization complicates this because it begs the question, who is our community?